This is the story of a unique royal relationship. The nature of the friendship between Fergie and Diana was quite complex. Of two women who became the strongest of friends and allies. I don't think you can underestimate how close they were. But who were also rivals plagued by insecurity and doubt. I remember Diana saying to me, well, you don't need me anymore, you've got Fergie now. They appeared an odd pairing. Shy die. Loud, fun-loving Fergie. Who's for me? <laughs> they were really chalk and cheese. It was always an uneasy friendship that was likely to end in tears. But they also shared a special connection beyond their royal roles. I think a lasting bond between these two women was the fact that they were damaged by the breakup of their parents' marriages. Tonight, we ask what brought Fergie and Diana together. Diana had an agenda here. She wanted to see one of her close friends marry into the royal family. What kept them close? She had quite a set too with Princess Anne, who was complaining about something that Fergie had done, and Diana stood up for her and said her piece. And what drove a wedge between them? Diana would be quite emotionally cruel, and if someone upset her, she'd just cut them off. Royal insiders reveal how, in good times and bad, they stood side by side. They were both plotting to leave their husbands. The world didn't know, the media didn't know. She wanted to give Diana the courage to break loose as well, which is why she would say, you jump and I'll jump too. And how the friendship finally faltered. Diana was absolutely furious. If that's how she wants to behave, and if she wants to go on television and talk about me, she's not going to be spoken to ever again by me. Ending in tragedy and regret. And on the night that Diana died, Fergie and, and called her, and of course she didn't answer. This is the story of Fergie and Diana, the royal wives at war. They were members of one of the most famous families in the world, sisters-in-law, both married to a prince. But the unique friendship between Princess Diana and Sarah Ferguson began long before they became royals. Diana and Fergie came from the, the same sort of area of life, so actually they knew each other from when they were about 14. Although they had known each other since adolescence, they only became close after they connected at a polo match in 1980. Prince Charles's polo manager was Major Ron Ferguson, Fergie's larger-than-life father. And so they met um, beside the polo pitches in Windsor, and, you know, they, they did hit it. Met Charles and uh, Sarah was 21, but actually they, they became good friends, you know, friends who lunched, friends who hung out and shopped together. Given their similar backgrounds, it seemed inevitable that they would become close. Well, Fergie and Diana were actually um, related. They were fourth cousins and their mothers were also close. They were at school together. They were good friends. They were part of the same aristocratic circle when they, when they were growing up. Diana was from a far more aristocratic background than Sarah. I mean, her family had been connected with royalty for centuries. Sarah's background, she always described it, I think, as sort of uh, minor country gentry. I mean, but she grew up on a, a, a nearly 500 acre estate in Hampshire. Both attended private boarding schools and they grew up with similar interests and passions. They were both sporty, they loved being outdoors. Sarah was a, a great horse rider, much better on, on horses than Diana ever was. Um, but, you know, that love of horses extended to polo matches. Neither of them were particularly brainy or academic. They, they didn't excel at school. That said, they did well and they were popular. The parallels in their early years continued, helping to cement their friendship. I think a lasting bond between these two women was the fact that they were damaged by the breakup of their parents' marriages. And unusually for both women, uh, they were abandoned, if you like, by their mothers. Both Fergie and Diana's mothers left their families to be with new parties when the girls were still young. They were both left with their, their, their fathers and more or less brought up by them. Aged six, Diana was subjected to a bitter custody battle where her mother was forced to give up her four children. Diana famously um, was very uh, distraught by the, the divorce of her parents. She was a very young girl when her, her mother moved out. It probably affected her for most of her adult life. Um, Fergie took the breakup of her parents much more in her stride. 
When Fergie was just 12, her mother left her family and moved to South America. Her mother lived and led a very exotic life. She remarried an Argentine polo player and relocated to South America. And Fergie um, had great memories of traveling there as a teenager and spending time with her mom and, and her stepdad on their ranch. But I suspect it had an unsettling effect on both of them. As Diana embarked on her life as a princess, she came to rely on her friend Fergie. Diana looked up to Sarah because she was so flamboyant. And Sarah just seemed to be kind of like that older sister in a way. Fergie had so much more life experience than Diana. You know, by the time she was in her her 20s, she'd had two living. At that point, when Diana was very young, those two years must have seemed incredibly sick. This way, this way, please. This is the story of a unique royal relationship. The nature of the friendship between Fergie and Diana was quite complex. Of two women who became the strongest of friends and allies. I don't think you can underestimate how close they were. But who were also rivals plagued by insecurity and doubt. I remember Diana saying to me, well, you don't need me anymore, you've got Fergie now. They appeared an odd pairing. Shy die. Loud, fun-loving Fergie. This for me. <laughs> they were really chalk and cheese. It was always an uneasy friendship that was likely to end in tears. They also shared a special connection beyond their royal roles. I think a lasting bond between these two women was the fact that they were damaged by the breakup of their parents' marriages. Tonight, we ask what brought Fergie and Diana together. Diana had an agenda here. She wanted to see one of her close friends marry into the royal family. What kept them close? She had quite a set too with Princess Anne, who was complaining about something that Fergie had done, and Diana stood up for her and said her piece. And what drove a wedge between them? Diana would be quite emotionally cruel, and if someone upset her, she'd just cut them off. Royal insiders reveal how, in good times and bad, they stood side by side. They were both plotting to leave their husbands. The world didn't know, the media didn't know. She wanted to give Diana the courage to break loose as well, which is why she would say, you jump and I'll jump too. And how the friendship finally faltered. Diana was absolutely furious. If that's how she wants to behave, and if she wants to go on television and talk about me, she's not going to be spoken to ever again by me. Ending in tragedy and regret. Well, on the night that Diana died, Fergie and um, called her, and of course she didn't answer. This is the story of Fergie and Diana, the royal wives at war. They were members of one of the most famous families in the world, sisters-in-law, both married to a prince. But the unique friendship between Princess Diana and Sarah Ferguson began long before they became royals. Diana and Fergie came from the, the same sort of area of life, so actually they knew each other from when they were about 14. Although they had known each other since adolescence, they only became close after they connected at a polo match in 1980. Prince Charles's polo manager was Major Ron Ferguson, Fergie's larger-than-life father. And so they met um, beside the polo pitches in Windsor, and, you know, they, they did hit it. Met Charles and uh, Sarah was 21, but actually they, they became good friends, you know, friends who lunched, friends who hung out and shopped together. Given their similar backgrounds, it seemed inevitable that they would become close. Well, Fergie and Diana were actually um, related. They were fourth cousins and their mothers were also close. They were at school together. They were good friends. They were part of the same aristocratic circle when they, when they were growing up. Diana was from a far more aristocratic background than Sarah. I mean, her family had been connected with royalty for centuries. Sarah's background, she always described it, I think, as sort of uh, minor country gentry. I mean, but she grew up on a, a, a nearly 500 acre estate in Hampshire. Both attended private boarding schools and they grew up with similar interests and passions. They were both sporty, they loved being outdoors. Sarah was a, a great horse rider, much better on, on horses than Diana ever was. Um, but, you know, that love of horses extended to polo matches. Neither of them were particularly brainy or academic. They didn't excel at school. That said, 
They did well and they were popular. The parallels in their early years continued, helping to cement their friendship. I think a lasting bond between these two women was the fact that they were damaged by the breakup of their parents' marriages. And unusually for both women, uh, they were abandoned, if you like, by their mothers. Both Fergie and Diana's mothers left their families to be with new partners when the girls were still young. They were both left with their, their, their fathers and more or less brought up by them. Aged six, Diana was subjected to a bitter custody battle where her mother was forced to give up her four children. Diana famously um, was very uh, distraught by the divorce of her parents. She was a very young girl when her, her mother moved out. It probably affected her for most of her adult life. Um, Fergie took the breakup of her parents much more in her stride. When Fergie was just 12, her mother left her family and moved to South America. Her mother lived and led a very exotic life. She remarried an Argentine polo player and relocated to South America. And Fergie um, had great memories of traveling there as a teenager and spending time with her mom and, and her stepdad on their ranch. But I suspect it had an unsettling effect on both of them. As Diana embarked on her life as a she came to rely on her friend Fergie. Diana looked up to Sarah because she was so flamboyant and Sarah just seemed to be kind of like that older sister in a way. Fergie had so much more life experience than Diana. You know, by the time she was in her, her 20s, she'd had two living. At that point when Diana was very young, those two years must have seemed incredibly significant. Diana was obviously that much younger and she was on the cusp of marrying the heir the throne and if anything she probably sought out Fergie for a, some pointers really because Fergie's father was sort of involved with Charles on a regular basis. I think both girls actually admired things in each other that they didn't have. Diana wants to be that slightly more devil may care, boisterous, robust individual that just seemed very comfortable in her own skin and Fergie probably wanted some of that rather sweet, shy, mellowness that Diana had. At the time, Diana had a close friendship with her three housemates she was living with in Knightsbridge. But with the unique parallels in Sarah and Diana's upbringings and Sarah's understanding of royal life, the pair soon became best friends. When Princess Diana married Prince Charles in 1981 in St Paul's Cathedral, her new friend Fergie watched on. Sarah was actually a very important person in Diana's life and in the run-up to the royal wedding and, and certainly those, those early years where she really helped Diana to find her feet. She was absolutely delighted for her friend and I think that's why they became so close. The princess even helped her friend with her wedding outfit. Fergie didn't have a lot of disposable income um, and she knew that um, a dress for something like the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales was going to be... Um, an expensive proposition. So Diana helped out uh, by providing her with some fabric and she got a dressmaker to make up something appropriate for her. Diana intended on bringing her new friend Fergie into her royal circle by having her take on the role of her lady-in-waiting. It's not a servant and it's not a friend. It's sort of somewhere halfway between. It's a genteel occupation and um, it's enormous, the enormous status. But the decision was taken out of the princess's hands. Sarah was told that she was actually unsuitable to be Diana's lady-in-waiting, which was a huge blow to Sarah. I think the royal family felt Sarah wasn't posh enough. Diana was persuaded that, that basically it was too risky having um, Sarah Ferguson was seen as a loose cannon. She was fun, but she made them nervous. Diana was actually quite upset about this. But maybe she didn't fight for Sarah enough. Um, maybe she could have put her foot down more. Sarah was snubbed once more when royal protocol dictated that she would also be excluded from a very key part of the celebrations. I think she was astonished to discover that she wasn't being invited to the wedding breakfast, um, the, the sort of the aristocratic version of the traditional reception. We know for the person that she wasn't invited. I don't know whether ever Diana realised how hurt actually Sarah was about this. The two young women didn't let the palace rules get in the way of their relationship. After the wedding, the friendship continued to grow. 
At just 20 years old, Diana was daunted by the pressures of royal life. How do you see your role developing as Princess of Wales? But it, my life will be a great challenge. Next, as Diana embarked upon her new role as future queen, she needed Sarah more than ever. But what lengths would she go to to keep her friend in her new royal circle? Diana had an agenda here. She wanted to see one of her close friends marry into the royal family. She also wanted a confidant and a best friend inside the palace. As Princess Diana attempted to settle into her new role as future queen, aged just 20, she turned to her friend Sarah for support. Diana found her someone, a sounding board, if you like, someone she could confide in. And she found her early months in the royal family extremely trying. Um, she complained many years later uh, that no one really showed her the ropes, told her what to do. She, it was either a case of sink or swim. If she made a mistake, she was made to feel terrible. But but there was no, it was none of that kind of support where people said, look, we know it's going to be difficult. Don't worry if you make a few mistakes. But when you enter the royal family, there are very few people that you can confide in. Everybody might go to the newspaper because you're the hottest story in town. Diana felt that Fergie was a safe pair of hands and that her secrets were going to be secure with her. Sarah became Diana's loyal confidant. They would frequently meet for lunch, you know, often once a week. And if they weren't lunching together at San Lorenzo, you know, they were at the palace catching up over cups of tea. She would really lift Diana and make her laugh, actually, which Diana really needed at that time. These barrels for me. <laughs> Fergie was a coper. Diana wasn't a coper. And I think Diana became dependent on Fergie, really, for that encouragement to believe in herself and they became much closer at that point. Despite initial failed attempts, Diana became more determined than ever to bring her friend into the royal circle. Well, I think Diana wanted Sarah to be a part of the royal fold for a long time. And when she was told that Sarah couldn't be a lady in waiting because she wasn't deemed appropriate, um, she, she had to rethink her strategy. And um, she came up with the idea um, that Sarah should meet Andrew. In fact, reconnect with Andrew, because Sarah had played with Andrew as a child. They mixed in, in similar circles. We love the Royal Ascot Week in June, and uh, she loves to host house parties at Windsor Castle. In 1985, the Queen asked Diana whether there was anyone she'd like to come along to the house party, any single young women, perhaps. Um, and Diana thought of Sarah, of Fergie. And at the back of Diana's mind um, was a very cunning plan to make sure that Sarah sat next to the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, which she did. By the time pudding was served, Andrew was sort of being familiar enough with this very bubbly, red-headed girl next to him to start feeding her pudding. We were made to sit next door to each other at lunch at Ascot. Yes, and you um, made me eat chocolate profiteroles, which I didn't want to eat at all. I then didn't have any, so I got hit. Then very it started hard. from there, I think that's probably where it <laughs> oh, that's... I was meant to be on a diet. Andrew soon asked Diana if he could bring Fergie to stay at Diana and Charles' country house, where the pair became much closer. Andrew and Fergie could really be themselves and spend time together without the glare of the press and anyone knowing. Princess Diana had a soft spot for Prince Andrew. As kids, she used to send him valentines because they lived nearby to Sandringham. She saw a lonely young man who needed a girlfriend. Diana had an agenda here. She wanted to see one of her close friends marry into the royal family. Not only did she think Sarah and Andrew were very well matched personality-wise, which, which they were, Diana also wanted a confidant and a best friend inside the palace. Within a matter of months, Sarah Ferguson and Prince Andrew were engaged. In the lead up to the wedding, Fergie made it clear that fitting in with royal convention was not a priority. And she immediately started to encourage Diana to follow suit. So Fergie was the first person to ever have a proper hen party or a bachelorette party to which Diana was invited. The details were revealed in Sarah's autobiography. They had a lot of fun. They dressed up as policewomen and they caused a bit of a scene um, at the palace. Now, these two apparently got put into a police van where the policeman recognised Diana and said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. And they all fell in fits of laughter. And I think Diana had the devilment, but Sarah was game to do it. Prince Andrew was celebrating his stag party on the same 
evening with friends, including Sir Elton John. The girls decided to drop in. Diana and Fergie gate crashed into Annabelle's nightclub where Andrew was there. They were hiding behind chairs, watching Andrew. Little did he know um, that they were there and, and spying. <laughs> They managed to con the policeman into shutting the palace gates just as Andrew's car was arriving back from the stag night. Um, so he thought something was up and madly put his car into reverse and went whizzing around uh, the Victoria Memorial, I think. At which point they thought, well, maybe we've... Um, maybe we've... Royal world. For Diana, this was, this was sort of manna from heaven. This was, you know, a whole new world of, of sort of spiritual freedom, in a way. Two are better than one, so if she gets someone like Fergie in the royal family too, uh, perhaps together uh, should, they've got that support as a team to try and change some of the really, you know, archaic uh, traditions of the royal family. On the 23rd of July, Sarah and Prince Andrew were married, just six months after becoming engaged. Sarah's wedding day was in great contrast to her friend Diana's, and the differences in their characters were clear for the world to see. Fergie looks like she was born to this wedding. Giggling, looked like she was having fun. She, I think there was some giant teddy bear even that she went off with in the carriage when she went to her home. Diana and Charles, very, very formal affair. Lots of sort of sidelong glances from Diana. Real, real shyness. Diana's had a lot of heads of state and important people because it was the future king and queen who were, who were marrying. Uh, with Fergie, it was, a, it was that bit more relaxed. And you could see that even with the balcony scene where Prince Charles asks his mother, may I, when the crowd say, give her a kiss, whereas Fergie's there with her hand cut to her ears as they're roaring, give her a kiss. Despite differences in their personalities, the two women had established a powerful bond. They were now not only best friends, but sisters-in-law their lives intertwined more than ever. We had our first Fab Four, Charles and Diana, Sarah and Andrew. They seemed to get along like a house on fire. You know, we had these, these two couples go skiing together, holiday together, do engagements together. It was just wonderful for, for the press. And Diana and Fergie were a joy. And for the early years, at least, this all looked like it was going to work very well. But royal life for Sarah and Diana was never going to be that easy. The pair had to deal with the rules and responsibilities that came with being a royal wife. Well, their lives were not their own anymore. They weren't just able to sort of do what they wanted. And I think they, they both realized after they got married that they had not married into a family, they had married into a firm. Fergie tells very graphically an account of her, you know, when she first went to Sandringham to, to before her marriage and, you know, met the Queen uh, and all the royal family and curtsied to the Queen and tripped over a corgi. Um, she spilt her drink on the sofa because she was so nervous and she didn't know how to address anyone, so she just curtsied to everybody. Even for Sarah, being on the inside of the firm, the royal family, it was a shock. Someone would point out that, you know, continually, oh, you mustn't do that, you mustn't wear that, you can't wear those clothes, you can't go to that event uh, dressed like that. Also that, um, you know, if someone else is leaving the palace for an event that day, Sarah couldn't leave before them. I mean, it was an absurd list of unwritten rules. I understand that Diana said, I told you it would be like this. <laughs> and, and Sarah said, yeah, it's bloody awful, isn't it? For Fergie, Diana's experience was vital. Fergie came to rely on Diana, as Diana had relied on her. Sarah certainly looked to Diana for guidance and help in the early years of her marriage and early years of learning the ropes of royal life. Um, I suspect that maybe Andrew was reasonably supportive, but essentially he was away because he was in the Navy and for most of their marriage, he was at home for only 40 days of the year. The princess quickly became the Duchess of York's guide. Diana helped um, Sarah deal with you know, being at public events where you can't throw bread rolls around and shriek and, and get drunk, don't say anything controversial and try not to flirt with all the men, which was very difficult for Sarah. <laughs> Diana's kindness, uh, wanting to repay Fergie for her support, uh, really came shining through. Even before the Duchess had become royal, Diana had been there to support her, particularly during Fergie's first appearance 
royal family, which caused her great anxiety. Fergie asked Diana to come with her, and, and Diana gave Sarah all the right advice on how she should um, handle herself that day. She even provided her with an outfit to wear. Sarah famously said that at her first royal engagement, she sort of just looked on in befuddlement. You know, this was completely alien to her. Um, and she looked over to Diana for some encouragement. And Diana said to her, just, just keep smiling. And, you know, that's what Sarah did. And it stood her in good stead. Fergie had been able to watch her friend blaze a trail before her, whether it was dealing with the press or the in-laws. Diana was very much the canary down, down the mine shaft when it came to uh, learning the royal robes. Um, but more than that, learning about royal fashion. And Sarah, she had to do that now. She had to be far more groomed, far more careful about what she wore. Sarah finally opened up about this in 1996 when promoting her autobiography on the radio. She was my friend and she is my sister and we are still sisters. I tried to emulate her and dress like her, but when you've got very little confidence, you sort of make a nonsense really of everything. Diana was an old hand at this. She'd been married for a number of years. She had the two boys. She was someone who um, Sarah Fergus could, could simply copy. Uh, safe mimicking Diana's behavior because Diana was always ahead of the curve. It's an interesting revelation about Fergie's self-esteem because for all the outward confidence that Fergie's got, clearly, you know, even she was struggling with joining the royal family. In the early months of Fergie's royal life, Diana even defended her in front of important members of the royal family. Diana had quite a set too with Princess Anne, who was complaining about something uh, that Fergie had done, and Diana stood up for her and said her piece. And it was rather brave of Diana, that she more or less asked Anne, you, you've got to give her a break, and Fergie's good for the family, but she's finding it hard to adjust, just as I did. For Diana, Fergie's entry to the royal fold was a godsend. It took at least some of the attention away from her at a time when the pressure was becoming unbearable. I think certainly it was a tiny bit of respite and um, not being in the glare of, um, you know, the public eye the whole time. I think probably it was, um, you know, kind of helpful for her. Sarah became a much needed ally within the family. She strived, I think the word she used, to protect her as a sister and as a friend at all times. I mean, that was really important for Fergie to, to, to stop the firm getting at Diana. She really was very protective of her. She'd stick up for her. Diana knew that a lot of the royal family didn't like her. Um, she felt picked on by some of the royal members. While Diana had a head start as a royal, Fergie had more life experience to draw from. Well, Fergie and Diana had very different entry points into the royal family. Fergie was a much more experienced woman. She had had a job in publishing. She had been very well-travelled. So she just was more mature. She was more sure of herself. I think what Diana needed all the time was someone to reassure her, someone to say, it's OK to question, to challenge what you're asked to do and how you're supposed to behave. It's your life as well. As both women attempted to navigate the mounting pressures of royal life and the difficulties in their relationships, they also looked for guidance from other sources. They both encouraged each other, really, to, to look for alternative therapies, to look for healers, uh, to look for psychics, astrologers. People, really, they're looking for answers to questions about their future. Astrologer Debbie Frank was introduced to Diana in 1989 and soon became a close confidant. Diana would just call me as and when, which sometimes, particularly when we first met, was extremely frequently, sometimes you know, more than once a day. What I helped Diana with was basically managing her public events that she was attending, how they went, and then obviously her personal life, how things were between her and Prince Charles. Diana and I established a very long friendship over the years until her death. Both women bought into this in a big way. And sometimes Sarah would consult her astrologer um, four times a day. It just shows how much they needed an outside influence and support. I don't think either of these girls were getting much support from any of the royal family members. Next, it seemed Diana and Fergie would always depend upon each other, but insecurity and suspicion would drive a
match between them. Diana would be quite emotionally cruel. And if someone upset her, she just cut them off. Marrying into the royal family brought Sarah Ferguson and Diana closer than ever. But the pressures of royal life would ultimately break their bond. The nature of the friendship between uh, Fergie and Diana was quite complex. At times contradictory, great rivalry, but also intense confidence. They were really chalk and cheese. But it was that unique set of circumstances of being within royal circles and then in the royal family that made the friendship possible. But it was always an uneasy friendship that was likely to end in tears. By the mid-1980s, Diana had become a global icon, but was also plagued with her own insecurities and paranoia. Even though Diana was more used to uh, mixing with royalty and aristocratic people, I still think it was easier for Fergie. Diana had said, you know, I went to lunch at the palace and I was really, really nervous. But Fergie just seemed to take that lunch in her stride. Underneath it all, I suspect Fergie probably thought Diana was quite weak, that she needed her help. She was happy to offer it. All of a sudden, um, the focus of attention was on, on Sarah. Up till then, everyone wanted to know all about Diana, and although her star did not fade uh, at this point greatly, nevertheless, Sarah was the new kid on the block. They called her a breath of fresh air. She loved all the things that they loved. She loved riding. She learnt to carriage drive with Prince Philip. She was a very proficient skier. She was, she was a real country girl. She loved dogs and horses. So she fitted in really well. In the beginning, Diana was thrilled that Fergie had joined the firm. She had an ally at court, her friend, and quite frankly, many members of the royal family thought it would help bring Diana out of her shell. Be the moody one, and Fergie was the good, fun, frolicking girl who was a breath of fresh air in the family. Oh, After a rocky start, Sarah fully settled into royal life. The differences between the royal wives were stark, and the once close friendship showed signs of strain. Diana was aware that Sarah was a very skilled manipulator of people to some extent because she famously said that Sarah had wooed the royal family and knew exactly what she was doing when she said certain things to certain members of the royal family. Diana was aware of the comparisons being made. She admitted that she got terribly jealous of Fergie, I think. You know, the, the Queen and Sarah seemed to have an easier rapport. Sarah made this foray into the royal family look easy when, as Diana said, she herself was, was struggling to survive. There was a point at which Charles said to Diana, why can't you be more Fergie? Now, for someone whose self-esteem is already pretty low, who's feeling very vulnerable, that wasn't just a rebuke. That would have been one of the most cutting, hurtful remarks that her husband could have made to her. Diana did her best to be more fun like Fergie. One attempt at Ascot in 1987 was to backfire. There was one occasion at Royal Ascot which they spotted a friend of Fergie's in the crowd, and they were all carrying umbrellas, and they poked her bottom with this umbrella. I mean, it's all very funny. But the, uh, the repercussions were huge, and they were both um, upbraided for sort of misbehaving in public. As the pressure on the Princess of Wales grew, Diana's marriage and health suffered. The royal family didn't understand Diana. Diana said much, much later that she, she thought that they'd never heard of postnatal depression, which she had after Prince William was born. And, you know, she was also unhappy in her marriage because she was convinced that, that Charles was seeing Camilla and she became obsessed with Camilla. She was bulimic. The Queen always said she's like a nervy racehorse. And she said, treat her with kid gloves. Later on, they blamed the failure of Diana's marriage on her bulimia, which wasn't really the case at all. So I think Diana was very much misunderstood. She was unsure of herself and she was very emotional. 
And the royal family are not used to people who emote. Um, you don't do that. You have a stiff upper lip. If you wish to cry, then go to your room kindly and do it there. Uh, but Diana wasn't that sort of... Cards, both women were struggling with their royal lives. I don't think either of them quite realised how their lives were going to be ruled by uh, courtiers, um, diary meetings, protocol, doing things correctly. Both were young women who'd been used to a certain amount of freedom. Fergie certainly used to a great deal of freedom. I think there were certainly times um, when Sarah just felt that she didn't measure up to her. She often compared herself to Diana, and I think there were times when she felt inadequate, whether it was that she wasn't as pretty as Diana, she wasn't as slim as Diana, she wasn't as loved as Diana. And as much as they were firm friends, there was a fair dose of um, royal rivalry between the two of them. Increasingly unhappy in her loveless marriage, Diana watched the loving marriage of her friend played out in the public arena. Diana really envied the easy, comfortable warmth and intimacy that, you know, and sexual chemistry, actually, that was quite clear between Andrew and Sarah. She had a much colder relationship with her own husband. I do think at this point Diana was really hoping that some of that warmth and intimacy and easygoing nature would rub off on her own husband. It was a stark contrast to Fergie's marriage. They were unlike any other royal couple. For the first time, a genuine affection was public. They were a very tactile pair. They constantly had their arms and hands over each other. And, and, and Charles and Diana were just not like that. I mean, by this stage, Charles and Diana were no longer even sharing a bedroom. And so there were so many of the intimacies that she saw with Andrew and Fergie were lacking in her own marriage. It must have been difficult for Diana to, to watch Sarah's marriage, which was such a happy marriage. There was Diana trapped in a marriage which she felt was, was loveless after a while, and she knew there were three of them in the marriage and Camilla was there, and then she would look at um, Sarah, and Sarah, Sarah's husband adored her. Prince Andrew just adored the way Sarah was. He never would have said, you know, can't you be more like Diana? It was very difficult for Diana because she started to get paranoid and she also looked at Sarah and thought, well, actually, how can I trust a woman that is sleeping with my brother-in-law and everything I tell her, she's going to tell him? And that paranoia, which happened a lot with Diana, with other people, had really set in. And she started just not being able to open up and trust Sarah anymore. The national Fergie mania was beginning to wear off, inside and outside of the royal family. It didn't take long before um, the honeymoon was wearing off and people rather tired of that exuberance that they'd once loved. It began unflattering headlines in the press. In an effort to win back public support, Fergie took part in a TV game show arranged by Prince Edward. It's a royal knockout will go down in royal history as uh, one of the biggest cock-ups of all time, I think. It was a disaster from beginning to end. It was absolutely humiliating. Sarah, with her usual um, gusto, entered into it. Um, and, you know, if she, if she gets into something, she, she does it with bells on. We're the best blue bandits there are. <laughs> Diana famously did not take part, nor did Charles. He thought it was something that was beneath them. In a way, it's, it's kind of unfair. Fergie um, took a lot of the blame, the flack, if you like, almost a scapegoat. Big bad blue baby! Her behavior was being commented on. Um, and I think then is when Diana came into her own. Diana got the headline, the Queen of Hearts and the People's Princess. But I think Sarah knew she could never be that. She could see that in Diana from the start, how serene she was. She looked a bit like the perfect princess. She looked like a supermodel. Sarah is honest and knew, look, I'm never going to be that person. She really was happy for her. Sarah knew her downfalls, but knew what she was good at. Next. In public, Diana and Fergie's friendship was masking a private rivalry. But over time, each became skilled at using their public image to gain the advantage. Without that determination to keep it going, their friendship would have started to sort of collapse. Diana and Fergie had been genuinely close in the early 80s. 
But as time moved on, the friendship faltered. Well, the reason that the friendship failed was entirely Diana. This is what Diana did. No one would believe that you could be great friends and do one thing wrong, and then Diana wouldn't speak to you. It, it was very unique to her. Diana would be quite emotionally cruel. And if someone upset her, she'd just cut them off, cut them out of her life. The rivalry between them would only increase. In the battle for public hearts and minds, the press was to be their weapon of choice. There was something about Diana that members of the public found utterly magnetic and were drawn to her. We're always talking about Sarah Ferguson as being Fergie. We would never have called Lady Diana Spencer Spency. I mean, that would just have never have happened because she wasn't as Spency. She was much going, sporty, loud, bubbly nature. Bye. I think that this did start the jealous reaction in Diana, because I remember Diana saying to me, well, you don't need me anymore, you've got Fergie now. And I thought, that's a strange thing to say. Um, but she really meant that. She, she felt very sidelined, and she knew she couldn't be as bouncy and as fun. What we saw in Fergie was an overcompensation to be liked, to be popular. Um, and that came out in quite a sort of loud and noisy and robust way. But underneath that, self-confidence. It didn't take much for her to feel that her self-esteem had taken a knock. While their private rivalry was never seen in public, the press reveled in pitting the two women against each other. The Duchess of York wore a deep pink suit, rather courageous for seven months pregnant. And the Princess of Wales, as so often, won the day in an Ascot grey tailcoat. The problem with the press in any situation like this is they love to make comparisons. So as Diana's authenticity and care grew in stature. Fergie had to be eclipsed. Whatever Fergie did, she was always going to be found wanting. Quick picks and I don't see actually. Really? I'm savoury. <laughs> I'm sausages. She didn't have the capacity to turn heads in the way that Diana did. Fergie tried to enjoy the press attention and it was quite a new thing for her to be the centre of attention and she responded to it by overdressing and being over noisy and over enthusiastic. Love you. I'll see you later. <laughs> and then of course she became criticized for it. In the beginning, Fergie was incredibly popular, but then it all went sour. And you can almost date that from when Fergie and Andrew went to Australia on a girl mission and they left baby Beatrice back at Buckingham Palace. Beatrice, uh, Beatrice just thanks you all for the three cheers. And Fergie got a lot of criticism for that. So as much as they lauded her and loved her, they turned against her in a very, very unkind way. When Fergie put on weight, they called her the Duchess of Pork. I don't think any member of the royal family has had so much vitriol poured upon them as Fergie did at one time. The bubble had burst, and the once celebrated Fergie began to struggle with unfavorable comparisons to Diana. While Diana's found herself and her self esteem flourished, Fergie's self esteem diminished. And so that bond that they had, that friendship, was almost quite betrayed at the point that Diana was at her most loved by the public. Fergie and Diana lived life in the royal goldfish bowl. Public scrutiny added to the pressure to live up to royal standards. Well, there were challenges clearly for, for both women, and I think particularly being in the spotlight and, and having every aspect of their lives, from their hairstyles to their outfits um, to their friendships, scrutinised in the press. Sarah seemed to have a thicker skin when it came to dealing with the backlash in the media. Like Fergie, Diana also struggled with her treatment in the press. When Fergie was getting all the headlines, all the favourable headlines, and Diana was being criticised for some of her, for her behaviour, uh, she was mortified and she was very jealous of Fergie. And she told me that she went for a long drive to a river in the south of England, sat down and had a real think about her future and thought to herself, I'm not Fergie, I've got to be who I am. 
Diana's um, relationship with the media was sort of hot and cold. I found it incredibly intimidating at times. As a parent, could I ask you to respect my children's space? And she was followed wherever she went. She also knew that keeping the press on side at this time, a very delicate negotiation over her separation from Prince Charles was vital. The media offered her the one chance of sort of evening up this battle, if you like. The treatment of both women in the press had an inevitable impact on their fragile friendship. Their relationship blew very hot and cold, and this was a lot of it, this was to do with Diana's personality. Um, so, you know, Fergie was in the ascendant and she was in the descendant. And then, then it turned round again. Fergie probably knew that, you know, once people put you on a pedestal, there's only one way, and that's done. The story becomes that you've got this sort of beautiful princess and you've got the sort of almost the ugly sister. That's really hard to sustain a friendship between two people when the press, for whatever reason, uh, have taken one completely to their hearts, whereas Fergie barely got a look in. The tables had turned. It was a desperate time for Fergie. Her rival was once again the darling of the press, the most photographed woman in the world. All Fergie's demons came back to haunt her. Fergie has struggled with, oh, I think it's probably self-respect, actually. I think when Fergie gets miserable, she'll probably comfort eat, she'll kind of become a bit reckless. The press will certainly say that she looked a mess or she looked ridiculous or that she didn't have any taste. The rivalry in private and in public was growing, and each would try to outcompete each other in the headlines. If Sarah was out on engagements on the same day as Diana, it was always going to be Diana who made the front pages of the newspapers the next day. And I think after a while, that, that probably did begin to grate with Fergie, and certainly there were times when she felt, I can't even compete. Without that determination to keep it going, their friendship would have started to sort of collapse. The underbelly of it would just start to, to sink and the connection between them would have started to break. Both girls were highly competitive and that competition spilled over into newspapers and magazines. They were rivals to, to that extent and they wanted to see their, their charities uh, give them more space than the others. Fergie says in her book that she actually did some AIDS charity work. It was for a friend and it was a one-off. But Diana was furious and she said, look, that's mine. Don't interfere. Which is very typical of Diana. And, and Fergie was, was quite distraught because she'd only done it to help a friend. Diana was becoming adept at working the press. Diana earned a reputation for being manipulative because she was aware of her star power. She used it to her advantage. She would play tabloids off against each other. And, you know, when things got really bad in the War of the Waleses, she would use the newspaper to, um, to fight her corner. And, and she did that in a way that um, Sarah didn't do. Sarah just didn't engage on that level. Sarah didn't have newspaper editors over to the palace for lunch. Um, I think it was probably something that she was too scared to do. Diana really knew how to manipulate the press. The ultimate example of this is the revenge dress that she wore to the Serpentine Gallery, and that was on the same night that Prince Charles's Dimbleby interview was being shown, in which he admitted adultery. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes. So she showed the world that this is what He's missing. Diana and Fergie had been friends for more than a decade. But as their lives took different directions, their friendship also changed course. So there was this gradual pulling away from Diana, partly because emotionally she didn't need Fergie so much, and partly because she was in a very different stage in her life, and then time goes on and they just weren't communicating anymore. Next, the friendship between Diana and Fergie had cooled in recent years, but a monumental change in their lives reunited the royal wives as common adversaries. They were both plotting to leave their husbands. 
The world didn't know, the media didn't know, but behind the facade of smiles and waves on that palace balcony, um, there were two deeply unhappy young women. After a turbulent decade of friendship for the royal wives, the next chapter saw one final heartbreaking rift. On the 15th of June, 1991, Diana, Princess of Wales, and Sarah, Duchess of York, stood on the balcony of Buckingham Palace and presented a united front to the world. I can tell you exactly what was going on behind the scenes at Troupe Colour in 1991. That was the last occasion on which they were photographed together in public. They were both plotting to leave their husbands. The world didn't know, the media didn't know, but behind the facade of smiles and waves on that palace balcony, um, there were two deeply unhappy young women. I think the two of them did discuss very openly the fact that they were unhappy. And they, do, they did discuss the idea of leaving the, the royal family, which of course is, at that point is just a really big line to, to cross. They'd actually come up with this scheme that they would go together. They would announce their separations simultaneously to set off this sort of death charge, if you like, under the royal family. For now, mending any earlier rifts. Putting their plans into action wasn't going to be easy. To enter the royal family is hard enough. To leave the royal family, to jump out of that goldfish bowl is quite something else. It obviously demanded a great deal of courage and planning. Long, long discussions late into the night about what should they do. Um, Fergie was the one who was leading the way on this. She wanted to give Diana the courage to break loose as well, which is why she would say, you jump and I'll jump too. Through their public engagements, it was becoming increasingly obvious to the world that the Wales's marriage was breaking down. We knew that Charles and Diana's marriage was a tough one and that they weren't happy. I mean, from the, the late 1980s onwards, newspapers were routinely recording the number of days, and these were growing year by year exponentially. I mean, there were vast periods of time when they had virtually no contact with each other. At the York's family home of Sunning Hill Park, it was a story. Andrew was at sea serving in the Royal Navy. It was reported they saw each other just 40 days in a year, leaving Fergie alone to do what she liked. The York's marriage began to unravel and unravel quickly. There were rumours that Fergie was seeing somebody else. The Duchess kept her head well down, ignoring all questions about the state of her marriage. Meanwhile, Diana was continuing to nurture her relationship with the press. I had by this stage i become quite friendly with, with Princess Diana and she contacted me and um, she sent me this message. And this was all to do with a devastating series of photographs which revealed that Sarah had been cheating on Prince Andrew. But why would Diana do this to her one time closest friend? I think Diana was incredibly skilled. She really was like a one girl PR band that knew absolutely how to handle the and um, and how to work it sometimes to her advantage. Diana's message to me was simply that she'd obviously heard that the photographs were coming. We all knew that these photographs were coming. It was one of the worst kept secrets in Fleet Street. What none of us knew or the rivals to the paper that had them didn't know was just what the photographs showed and how damaging and devastating they were going to prove to be. She knew and I suspect she was going to take some kind of vicarious thrill from the um, embarrassment it was going to heap onto Fergie. In the end, after all this back and forth, Fergie jumps first. On the 19th of March, 1992, the Duke and Duchess of York had initiated discussions for a formal separation. The Duchess was in apparently carefree mood as she collected Princess Beatrice from school, just at the moment the official statement was being handed out at the palace. And the ordeal wasn't over yet for Fergie. Very busy patch, my patch, of being royal correspondent. Jen, we need you in the office. Uh, not going to believe this one, but Fergie's been found having her toes sucked by her financial advisor in South France. Can you come in the office? I thought, oh my goodness me, you know. 
do I have to cover stories like this? But yes, I did. And yes, it was a very big story. On the 20th of August, 1992, Fergie was at Balmoral for the annual summer holiday with her children and the rest of the royal family. There she was with all the members of the royal family, who traditionally um, have all the, the papers laid out at the breakfast table. The scene when she went into the dining room was horrific for her because there were her brothers-in-law um, turning over the pages, staring at her naked top half of her body. It was excruciatingly embarrassing. She then went to the Queen and the Queen was livid. She was absolutely furious with Sarah. After her toe-curlingly awkward morning at Balmoral, Fergie made her exit. Using one of the many side entrances to the royal estate, the Duchess drove at speed to the airport of Aberdeen to catch a scheduled flight to London. Diana was rumoured to have played her part in the timing of Fergie's front page story. But why? It's not the friendliest thing to do, but, you know, if she's desperate, maybe she thought that was a sacrifice worth making for her own sanity. But Diana's tactics to divert the media spotlight from her to friend Fergie was short-lived. Her own scandalous revelation was about to take the heat off Fergie. We got news that there was a tape recording of a conversation Diana had had with a man friend. If you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. A man called James Gilby was now being released to the paper. The so-called Switchygate story had knocked Fergie off the front page. The telephone conversation allegedly involving the Princess of Wales is reported to have been taped on New Year's Eve, six days after these pictures were taken at Sandringham in 1989. And rocked the royal family once more. With scandals behind them both, the friends were now entering a new phase. On the 9th of December at 3.30pm, Prime Minister John Major announced in the House of Commons the separation of the Prince and Princess of Wales. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. Both royal marriages were over, but had Diana and Fergie's friendship survived? They really did share so much as royal wives, as, as royal mothers, through good times and bad times. Next, as the former sisters-in-law tried to rebuild their lives... Diana was absolutely and talk about me and the fact that I had given her verrucas. Diana did not see the funny side of it. Princess Diana and Sarah Ferguson had a turbulent relationship and it didn't end with their marriages. A double divorce marked a new era. Policemen clear the way for the princess this evening as she leaves a London hotel. Grim-faced, 17 million pounds richer. It was strange times. The settlements that both women got after their divorce, of course, were very different. But then their status was very different. Fergie, funnily enough, only ended up with about 600,000. But the Queen had paid off a lot of Fergie's debts beforehand. And the Queen had dished out uh, at least two or three million pounds on Fergie over the years. Unfortunately, money just ran through Fergie's fingers and the Queen knew that. She's been accused of extravagance, bad taste and an over-exuberant manner. And of course, this played into the bad publicity always for Sarah. Sarah always in trouble in everywhere you can think of, either her behavior or her misbehavior or her finances. No longer sisters-in-law and embracing the single life, did they still need each other as friends? One of the things that emerged post-divorce for both of them was that Fergie represented uh, an area of Diana's life that she didn't really want to remember anymore. And as long as she maintained a friendship with Fergie, she was always going to be reminded of some really difficult times in her life. And so when Diana moved on to almost full independence away from the royal family, I think Fergie would have been quite triggering for Diana. Diana very much became her own woman. Now, the only people she uh, adored and depended upon and had unconditional love for, really, were her two children. She was very self-contained in that way. Fergie turned to someone surprising for support, her former husband. Andrew became almost what Diana was to Fergie during her difficult time. She'd gone back and redeveloped or 
reignited that friendship with her husband, whereas Diana didn't need Fergie. In 1996, Fergie decided to put her story across. She'd watched Diana do it in the Andrew Morton book in 1992. Now it was her turn. The Duchess today in a New York bookshop, helping launch her just-published autobiography. It was very frank, very telling. It was, it was an interesting read, quite poignant, actually, in many places. But behind palace gates, a storm was brewing. Diana was annoyed with Fergie. And Fergie her, was promoting her book, or in any interviews. But, of course, all anyone that interviewed Fergie wanted to talk about her relationship with Diana. <laughs> And there was one particular line the press seized upon. Diana was absolutely furious about this. She really, really found that very distasteful. If she wants to go on to American television and talk about me and the fact that I'd given her barucas. This was relayed in, in, in quite a joking manner in the autobiography, but Diana did not see the funny side of it. Fergie's attempt at humour backfired and further damaged her already fragile relationship with Diana. When you've got a friendship that's already imploding, it's collapsing, it's disconnecting because you're not really in touch with each other, uh, a lot of friendships like that will just fade away. But then someone could take a decision to say, OK, I don't want it to fade away, I'm going to do something dramatic and do something uh, that will ensure that it has a clean break, that that person won't want to be my friend anymore. The line, however it was intended, proved disastrous. She felt betrayed, in short, and she rang her up and she said, uh, look, this is your book, not mine. And Diana, after that, refused to take um, Sarah's calls, refused to see her. It was a massive overreaction from Diana, but it wasn't altogether surprising to me. I knew her very well at that stage. Um, she felt she was juggling a, a, a new life. She was trying to find a way forward. She thought that they, they trusted one another, they had an agreement, they didn't, they didn't tread on each other's toes, was how Diana put it to me. And here was Diana having her toes trodden on by Fergie with sort of outsized big boots on them. Part of the complexity of Diana's personality was that she'd fall in and fall out with people all the time. Diana felt that Fergie had let her down uh, and she could no longer be trusted. Mom Later, it's thought Diana did reach out via a mutual friend. She had asked someone, where's the redhead? Because she used to call her the redhead. So I think there was a glimmer of hope that perhaps the ice was thawing. But any hopes of reconciliation would never be realised. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. On the day that uh, the news was given to... to as it was to the rest of us, that Diana had been killed in that car crash, um, she was undoubtedly devastated. Well, on the night that Diana died, Fergie was in Italy and called her, and of course she didn't answer. Uh, Fergie was trying to, uh, to hire a private plane to fly to Paris to see what was going on. Fergie again. I know they would have done, and I know it would have all been forgiven, but it was very, very painful for Fergie to have, you know, like her close, close friend I so tragically. Shortly before Diana died, she'd spoken to me about Sarah. She always referred to her as the redhead. She always wanted to know what was going on in her life. I felt that it was an indication that perhaps Diana was ready to resume the friendship. And I think Sarah would have grasped the opportunity with both hands. She called me, actually, a day or two after Diana's death, and we spoke on the phone, and she was very tearful. The conversation was very much up in their own difficulties, the great sadness that had come between them, and how she regretted it all. The one person within the royal family who understood her better than anyone had gone. And so I think it was a, a huge and profound loss for her when Diana died. Diana's death sparked days of extraordinary public grief and brought to a tragic end one of the most compelling chapters in the history of the modern royal family. I think it was very important for Fergie to have attended Diana's funeral. 
she would have felt so desperately sad for her boys, so desperately sad. The body of a princess so loved by her people leaving the sanctuary of the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace on its way to rest one last night in Kensington Palace. I think if Diana was around today, she and Sarah would definitely have gotten over Baruka Gate. Um, and I think there would still be a firm friendship. You know, after all, they went through so much together. I don't think you can underestimate how close they were and how unique their lived experience had been. You know, they had shared something really, really unique and special and traumatic at the, at the same time. Ultimately, these two women had shared an enormous amount together and a unique experience together. So few people know what it's like to marry into the royal family, to be transported from being an ordinary person to a princess or a duchess and all that goes with it.
Aged six, Diana was subjected to a bitter custody battle where her mother was forced to give up her four children. Diana famously um, was very uh, distraught by the, the divorce of her parents. She was a very young girl when her, her mother moved out. It probably affected her for most of her adult life. Um, Fergie took the breakup of her parents much more in her stride. When Fergie was just 12, her mother left her family and moved to South America. Her mother lived and led a very exotic life. She remarried an Argentine polo player and relocated to South America. And Fergie um, had great memories of traveling there as a teenager and spending time with her mum and, and her stepdad on their ranch. But I suspect it had an unsettling effect on both of them. As Diana embarked on her life as a princess, she came to rely on her friend Fergie. Diana looked up to Sarah because she was so flamboyant. And Sarah just seemed to be kind of like that older sister in a way. Fergie had so much more life experience than Diana. You know, by the time she was in her her 20s, she'd had two living. At that point, when Diana was very young, those two years must have seemed incredibly...